Welcome back to our video module on forced harmonic motion. Let's pick up where we left off. So let's start off with the case of, um, let's scroll down a little bit, get ourselves a little bit of space, and let's start off with the situation where we have an unforced system. So this corresponds to F being zero. We know that there's three main examples of this. The first one is underdamped. So in this case we have f equals zero and b squared is less than 4km. We'll call this scenario one. Scenario two will be our overdamped situation. This once again f equals zero and b squared is greater than 4km. And in that case, maybe we have something that looks like this. We'll call that scenario two. And our third unforced scenario is critically damped. We know that to be f equals zero, b squared equals 4km. And that one might look a little bit like this. Notice that it comes closest to equilibrium faster than it would here. And in each of these three cases, what's special about them is all we see is the transient solution. So once these initial conditions have kind of worn off, we see the system is right along zero, right along zero. It's hit its equilibrium, equilibrium position. Our steady solution, our steady state solution is just zero. Let's take a look at a system being driven with a really, really high oscillation. Here's Andy Ruina at Cornell. If I move it up and down fast, well, what happens? Well, one thing is this is just bobbing up and down anyway, so I want to get rid of that and just see what's left over due to my hand moving up and down fast, and it moves up and down a little bit. Please note that the application of the force in this spring system is different than the application of force in our example system in this video module. That said, the particular points that we're making about both the graph and the equations are consistent between the two. Let's call this scenario four. And just like Andy did in the video, we're going to bring the system to an equilibrium position so that the initial conditions are pretty much all at zero. And what we see is as we drive that force, and if x is the response, what we see is a small kind of wobbles or small vibrations in x with a given amount of force. But we don't see the position significantly changing. We've set up the initial conditions to not influence the behavior, or at least influence it in a minimal way. So x, x dot, and x double dot are equal to zero. So this homogeneous solution, it's gone. Transient solution's gone. We're going directly to steady state. Now before we try and figure this out, I'd like to write another form of a particular solution with the sinusoidally varying force. Let's use C1 cosine cosine of alpha t minus phi. So basically we're introducing a sinusoidally varying function with some sort of phase change. And let me write down what C1 equals. So we can see it's still a mess, but we only have to deal with one constant. We're not going to worry about the phase change for now. Now that said, we can look in here and we can see that when alpha or the driving frequency gets really big, this term gets big, this term gets big, and as a result, the denominator is large and C which expresses the amplitude of the oscillation goes down. Let's look at the other extreme. Here's Andy Ruina driving the same system with a really slow frequency. If I move my hand up and down very slowly, it goes down with my hand and up with my hand. So let's try and model this. We'll call this number five. And in this case, it's a slowly oscillating system. Nice and smooth, goes like this. And as the force oscillates, the position oscillates 
with it. Does this make sense? Well, let's take a look at our equation. What do we expect to happen? We expect that as alpha gets smaller and smaller, this term is going to want to go to zero. Mo this term is going to want to go to one. So we end up with a amplitude that gets closer and closer to F over K. Now thus far, we've been very care careful to keep the homogeneous solution and the particular solution completely separate. For instance, numbers one, numbers two, and number three, we're only looking at the homogeneous solution. Then for number four and number five, we're looking at the steady state or the particular solution. Finally, let's take a look at what it might look like if we combine these two. So for our next scenario, we'll call it scenario number six, we're going to take number five, but we're going to allow it to have some sort of initial velocity. Now over time, we expect the steady state to match number five. So by the time we get here, we should be pretty much back to steady state. And conversely, right off the bat, we expect the steady state or the, or, uh, the driven force to have a minimal influence. So what we might see might look something like this. We can see that it has some sort of initial velocity and the amplitude is decreasing exponentially as damping fits in. And then by the time we get down here, we see that the amplitude has decreased significantly from, through the transient period, and we're now approaching a steady state solution. So what would that look like up here? Well, up here, we're starting off with our homogeneous solution, and because time is close to zero, this term is going to be really significant, which means that this A, it might be a big number, this B might be a big number, and this term is going to be somewhere around 1.9, 0 0.8. But as time goes by, the influences of this A and this B are going to decrease and decrease until all we're left with is our C and our D, or really, let's, let's transition and use this solution and all we're left with is this coefficient here. I see we're pretty much out of time. Let's call it quits for now and we'll rejoin in the next video.